true or false, sin consciousness is not from God, but is the condemnation of the enemy and should be ignored. Who wants to go first? I'll go first, and since I've been going last, the first two questions, I might as well go first this time. Uh, um, obviously, I, I, I have borrowed, didn't steal it, Lisa. I borrowed it. And the, the saying that quite a few of the sayings of Lisa, uh, one of them was, um, uh, we should be uh, uh, sun conscious, not sin conscious. And that's very true. I, and uh, I made a video titled, uh, Let's Stay Focused on Jesus. And that's the same principle. If we're focusing on Jesus, uh, we're not focusing on sin. So we're not going to be thinking about sinning. And we're not going to be, uh, the more you think about something, the, the, the more inclined you are to uh, to uh, ha have it as a problem in your life. Uh, but if you're focusing on Jesus, you certainly sin wouldn't be a problem if you're always on, focused on him instead. However, uh, if you do become aware, you are conscious of some, some sin, uh, even though we are uh, forgiven and our standing uh, before, with God is, is uh, secure, and even any sin we do is not going to affect that. So why should we care about sin? Well, we don't want to go so far. As a matter of fact, I watched a sermon by... Um, I'll think of his name in a minute, but he's a, he's a famous pastor. Um, uh, it was, but but he was uh, making a sermon. It was titled um, "Hyper Grace." Now, you know, I'm quite sensitive and and uh, quite uh, against the uh, the term "hyper grace" because uh, I, I think that uh, grace, the whole concept of grace, is hyper. Is that hey, let's. You can't take it too far as far as, you know, it, it, it's abundant. It's, it's uh, I forgot the, the verses to, to, to quote, to, to illustrate it, but look, great grace is, uh, grace abounds. Um, however, uh, even though I don't, maybe we can think of one or two people we've encountered that are uh, abusing it and, and that might be uh, classified as, Oh, hyper grace. They, they're taking it too far and they're, they're using it as an excuse to continue with their sin. None of us are in favor of that. We speak out against that. We teach against it. It's not what we want or we don't encourage it. But um, uh, it, it, I really don't think uh, there's very many people taking it that far. In the sermon I listened to, though, uh, he did cite an author. Uh, and he said there were more like him that were uh, teaching it and, and taking it to such an extreme that we should not even be conscious of a sin at all and be concerned about it at all, just forget about it. But I do think that, hey, we, if we're aware of our sin, there are a lot of things, sins we do that we don't even realize we're doing it. But certainly, if you're aware of some sin in your life, uh, we should not uh, it, it ignore it. I mean, we, it, we need to realize that sin comes with its own consequences. You're not going to get away with your sin. Uh, you, you won't have to go to hell because of your sin, but it doesn't, it's not, you don't get a, a free pass for your sin. You're, there's going to be some kind of a cost to you if you have sin in your life. Uh, so you should want to be aware. And when the spirit is grieved, I believe that is, some people say that the spirit does not convict us of sin, but I believe when, when we have um, the uh, spirit grieve, that that's what's happening. Uh, there's, uh, there's some kind of a failure on our part, or else the spirit would not be grieved. And so when the spirit is grieved, we don't want to just tune out this great spirit until it's finally quenched, and we, we're not even in uh, tune with it anymore. Uh, so we need to respond when we... We grieve the spirit and we're aware that there's some sin. We need to uh, pray and, and do what we can to, to correct that problem because you're not you're going to have something like, let's just take, for example, let's say you decide that you're going to, uh, you're lusting and you're, you're, not, you're not satisfied or happy with your, your sex in your marriage. So you go out and decide to get uh, uh, sex outside of your marriage and commit adultery. You're not going to get away with it. 
There, there's going to be either uh, some unplanned pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy, or some tr tr transmitted disease, or there's going to be uh, you get caught and then and then there's a divorce and now there's a, a, a broken family. All these things are consequences. So um, I do say that uh, let's focus on Jesus. Let's not be conscious of sin. But when we are aware that there's sin, but don't ignore it and act like it's not a problem. We need to get sin out of our life when we do become aware of it. Okay, uh, who wants to go next? I do, I'll be brief. Um, Brother Luke. I'll go, oh, so Lisa. Lisa That's okay, I'm gonna be real brief. I'm gonna be real brief. Brother Luke no, don't, stole no, my answer. Yeah, no, I'm about to get a truck. No, I got nothing to say. Brother Luke stole everything I was gonna say. He literally copied right off my page. I don't know how you did it through the computer, Luke, but. <clears throat> Sister, nice trick. I, told, I told you I would just borrow your stuff, not steal it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm ser literally almost verbatim. I said, Oop, you're muted, Sister Lisa. I can't hear you. Let's come back to I think you just dropped off. Oh, okay. So, Lisa, we can't hear you. So come back and tell us the end of your answer when you get when you're able. Okay. I don't have one. You took oh. it. That was oh. it. That's it. Then. That's what I'm saying. I got nothing to say. All right. <laughs> Amen. Give me a high five or high ten. Yeah. Okay. Angel, what do you say? So I think that when we talk about sin consciousness, I think it um at least for me that that, that particular phrase always brings up the idea of um uh, of being conscious of your sin, basically in terms of your salvation. But um, if I divorce it from that understanding, I I think sin consciousness is actually quite important because the I think that a lot of us would agree that the you know perhaps the original sin or the the, the, the most damaging of all sin is pride. And um, a lot of the sins that are overt, like adultery, you know, stuff, the stealing, things like this, you know. You know, obviously, I think it's important to be conscious that those things are sin. I think that that's what, like, understanding that God calls certain things sin for a reason, and it's because it will lead to um, chaos and uh, entropy in your life, uh, where where your you know there will be consequences, there will be um, uh, a, you know a, like a cascade of negative things that result, and the, I think. Um, a lot of the, the sin I try to be most conscious of are the things that are the hardest to be conscious of because they're, they're the things that, you know, really slip by and pride is the really big thing. Pride is the thing that I see that um, even among people that are safe believers is always the, the thing that, uh, that remains and that sometimes it'll, it'll baffle me how, how blind people can be to it when pride is the motivator behind, you know, what, the things they do and the way that they behave and they'll double down when challenged. Um, because, uh, in, in that way, they're not conscious of their sin. They're not conscious of their pride. They don't want to face it. Um, I, I think that it's also a huge killer in marriages. Um, because these things that are, I guess you call them secret faults, the thoughts of your heart. I think that those are, uh, I think God wants us to be more, conscious of those things than almost anything else and really when we are a lot of the a lot of the other sin that would people would consider more overt um kind of gets nipped in the butt because a lot of it stems from these things that are inside that are in our heart um in the first place um and so i know ever since i i you know got saved i the thing god has convicted me most about is 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 where my heart's at when i do things and trying to act in good faith with others and um, trying to uh, to navigate my relationships with people and the things that I do day to day uh, uh, from, a, from the right place and to try to, to, you know, to root out pride wherever it might be hiding because um, that is what blinded me uh, all my life and I didn't realize it. Um, and that's why I was, I was lost for so long. And so, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to, to ignore uh, consciousness of sin altogether, because that would almost imply that to ignore even what God calls sin. 
and then to just behave accordingly however you want like as if as if um you know those are just technicalities and that there it wasn't you know the things he named sin weren't called sin for a reason um and he had very good reason for for every you know everything he ever named a sin and i think that there's a, a spiritual um like uh, almost like a law you know at least a couple of the law of physics but it's like the the law of the spirit at play where you know certain outcomes are guaranteed um when we violate certain laws now our salvation has nothing to do with it but um the way that our our life unfolds and, and the way that uh we relate to those around us has everything to do with um with this law of the spirit um in terms of you know uh, doing things in the right spirit um and you know we talk about your heart's in the right place or my heart's right with god and i think that that is about facing yourself and about actually you know um uh judging righteous judgment and um uh, uh actually you know taking an honest inventory of your own your, your own motives for all the things that you do and when you're running from something when you're hot you don't want to face something when you're holding on to something because because you it's not so much that you care about what's true but you just want to you, you just it, it tickles your flesh somehow to continue uh thinking a certain way um and uh and you don't want to be challenged on it um you know, especially in marriage, I see, you know, I, I, I know that this has to be a problem because um, our marriage has always been very harmonious. But in the very beginning, um, especially prior to, 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 you know, Joel going back to the Lord and me becoming a believer, um, pride was, uh, you know, if, if you know, we still barely had any arguments, but when we did, it was, you know, not only pride that caused the argument most of the time, but pride that would uh, inflame the argument. And it's just the easiest thing to not be aware of because you don't want to be aware of it because pride in itself, like by its very nature, wants to hide and, and, and you want to, to um, I mean, it, it motivates you to not face yourself. My mother was a, you know, a safe believer, but this was a, this was probably her fatal flaw was pride because there are so many things that she would do out of, out of anger or spite and pride. And then out of pride would refuse to admit she'd done them or deal with them. And if you cornered her, she was like a, a caged animal, you know, she'd just fight even harder not to face it because that's what pride does. And so, um, I, you know, for me, I think that that would just be the biggest danger of somebody trying to ignore sin consciousness because of the fact that pride is so is so sneaky and so toxic in your life and you know and in your relationship with God. And I do believe the more you blind yourself to the way pride motivates you to, to treat others in a certain way or to conduct your relationships in a certain way, where you're you're not really acting in good faith. The more risk you stand of actually becoming blind to other things and maybe going off into deeply heretical directions um, and not listening to God anymore because your pride starts to speak louder than, than that still small voice. And um, so, yeah, so I would, I would say uh, mostly false uh, for my answer. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, sister. That was very humble of you. <laughs> I tried. All right. All right, brother Ben. Well, uh, yeah, pride is a big thing. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, you enter the Christian, you enter your relationship with, with God, um, and it, I believe it's maintained successfully through honesty. You know, it's honesty and um, not only accepting the truth about yourself that you're a sinner, you're, you're not righteous. God is. I mean, so recognizing uh, and acknowledging the truth and being honest about yourself and um, your sin and other, other things are is the is a foundational premise of a of a re re relationship with anyone, uh, let alone God. Um, and so I think that's where, um, uh, like Angel said, uh, pride is 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 a, is really suppressing the truth. I mean, if you're not if you're if you're prideful, you've got nothing to be proud about. I mean, you're 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 not being honest in your assessment of yourself. Um, 
Uh, and but but this whole question too, it's a great question by the way, um, Heather. You always come with great questions, but uh, I'm surprised by everyone's answer because, um, Angel, if you could mute, please. Um, the um, you know, because a lot of people bring up this verse here in, in Hebrews. Uh, it says Hebrews ten two, is in, in, so it says, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect for when they, for when would they not, for then would they not have ceased to be offered question mark for the worshipers once purified would have no more consciousness of sins. So a lot of people would say, a lot of believers would say, uh, and I've seen it even in our chat uh, regularly that uh, we should have no consciousness of sins. We should have no, you know, uh, we, we should not be thinking of our sins at all. Uh, you know, again, sins have been taken care of. Well, yes, it has been. And and we should not have consciousness of sins from a from a salvation perspective. It's never going to affect our relationship with God um, in terms of a uh, an eternal relationship. But there's, again, comparing scripture with scripture, taking that one verse out of context, uh that again it's important that the context here is uh really um about you know the, the consciousness no they you know they had they knew in hebrews that they knew had they had to do re repetitive works over and over again to restore their relationship with god essentially and so in that sense they have a consciousness like they always had to they always knew that there was a, a work they would have to do to make uh, restore that relationship whereas um that is not how we should uh uh, we, uh, how we how we should um, our works are, cannot restore or, or have any effect on on our relationship with God. However, again in, in second first uh, first Corinthians it says, you know, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged by God. So uh, how we how, how are we not able to judge ourselves if we were not to have any remembrance or uh, conscious of our own sins? No, it's we. I think we. I think you're lying to yourself. You're saying you have no consciousness of your sins. I think the Holy Spirit does convict this, uh, uh, or at least uh, you know, um, not convict this necessarily, but um, you can quench the Holy Spirit. And God does, I believe, discipline us, chastise us. In fact, he even says in Hebrews that uh, they had forgotten that uh, God treats them as sons, and they're, when they're being chastised, that God's treating them as sons. And uh, again, that chastisement is is to correct us. And so, if we're not consciousness of our, our failings, um, th then how can we grow? It's impossible. You're lying to yourself. Um, so I think we I, I absolutely um, we should be conscious of our sins in the sense of not that we have to do a work to correct them um, or, or or restore a relationship with God, but to, but to grow. And um, and again, it you know I, I have always had a very healthy fear of God. Um, and I, I, I really wanted to understand as a new believer, okay, you know, I, I gotta have all these momentary weaknesses and things like that. I mean, um, uh, are you going to take me out early or things like that? And, and I've studied this very carefully and, and the, what I see in scripture is God doesn't, it's not, it, it's your momentary weaknesses. God, it's not what get, get God's upset. It's when you accept those things, which when you embrace that sin or make excuses for that sin or suppress that you are engaging in that sin whether it be pride or sexual immorality whatever it may be uh that's when god gets upset that's when he turns up the heat you know again i think he's very merciful and he wants you to grow and that's why in like for example in first corinthians when they're getting drunk at, at the lord's supper and uh cutting and you know eat, eat, uh gorging themselves on the food essentially that was meant to uh serve as a remembrance for what the lord did for us um he said that the formula is uh, is progressive. You know, some were weak, some were sick, and then some even died. So I, I believe again, God kind of slowly turns up the heat, and so that uh, you will correct yourself. Uh, and again, if we had no consciousness of sin or no consciousness of His judgment, then how could we possibly grow? Uh, and again, people use this verse in in, in Second Hebrews uh, to abuse that premise that we you know oh we you know uh, uh, we should have no remembrance of sins. Uh, sin has, should have no dominion over us in, in Romans 2, for example. Well, yeah, it has no dominion over us in, in an eternal perspective. It has no, it has no claim on you from, from, from a judgment perspective in, in the court of, you know, in, in, in the balance of heaven and hell. But, um, but he, it, 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 because of that, because it has no, uh, 
it, it no, we're no longer under the law of sin and death. We should live our outer life accordingly. It's not an excuse to sin. It's not an excuse for that at all. And I see a lot of people uh, abusing that. Um, it's it's rather an exhortation. Is that because you've been freed of that? How, why? How? Because you died to something. How could you? Uh, why should you go back and wallow in it? You're wallowing in death, uh, and it will have you will have a death like sin. Living in sin, walking in the flesh, is a death like experience. Um, whereas walking in the spirit is life. Uh, choose life. Uh, so that, that's my initial answer. All right, I have a question. It, um, I, I wouldn't uh, correct you on anything you said, but I have a wondering, what did you mean when you said that you're surprised by everybody's answers? Um, well, again, so at some, I, I, there's a lot of people, uh, there's, again, there's a lot of people that would say, you know, again, that, uh, I'm I'm surprised by some people's answers. <laughs> that's that, that's that's what I would say. Yeah, but I'm asking you specifically what what answer did anybody say that was surprising or that you disagree uh, just, with? Just uh, I guess based on comments I've heard before, um, pe people would say you know again uh, that we you know I don't know I, I think I I think some some there's things I've heard before where it's like wow uh, are you forgetting about this verse you know um, that you know so that's why I would say that. I've heard so you were surprised that people's answers agreed with you because yes. I thought everybody yes. answered. Okay, okay, yes. okay. Yes, that's what I thought. Mm. Even okay, mm. okay, I'll, I'll I'll go as far as this. Um, in First John, uh, I, I believe again the whole premise of that of that of, of First John, and I'm convinced of it. Like I mentioned before, I've studied First John. I I, I studied the the uh, the most difficult verses in the Bible and the most the, the most difficult uh, most controversial. Uh, books of the Bible the most. Uh, I'm not recommending that anyone do that, but that's personally what I did. And it, at first, I, 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 you know, I would study that really hard, and then I would like, put it, set it aside because I, like, the best way for me to learn something is just to dive headfirst in. Get set, and it makes you sense, makes me super sensitive to all the arguments, the the different perspectives, and so then I can go back and go back to the easier verses and see where people are drawing out these where they're coming from and then i could kind of go back once i had that go back to the easier stuff go back to the hard stuff and get a better perspective of the big picture and i think i have a great like for hebrews i think i have a great understanding of first john i think i have a great understanding of second peter i have a great understanding of and those are all books that are very uh controversial in fact i would say i understand those books better than any other and first john is a controversial book because uh i believe it is a book about how to abide have how how to have your joy full, and, and and to do that, it's about abiding in Christ, and it's it's about intimacy and fellowship. So, um, I I, I know because of different uh people's for ideas of how they would define fellowship or intimacy, I define it as intimacy intimacy essentially or knowing at an experiential level. That's what First John is about. How to again abide Christ, see Him face to face, so to speak, uh, know Him intimately. And, and I believe by doing that, when you're doing that, but that book is about, in many ways, about, again, how to abide in Christ and an exhortation to abide in Christ. And that's where that controversial verse is, where it says, um, uh, if we confess our sins, he is uh, faithful and just to forgive our, give our sins and cleanse us, uh, cleanse us for all, from all unrighteousness. And again, I know, that, that, that Luke, I think you would say, for example, that that verse is, is just... A, I, I, it would like would be like just like in the middle of the personal like a gospel message, and I and I personally would disagree with that. I think uh, th that is true. It it could serve as a gospel message, but in the context, it's about when you're while you're abiding in Christ, as you're abiding in that light, He's going to show you, He's going to show you things about yourself. And if you just like again, confession is really nothing more than agreeing. You know, to when you come into agreement with Christ, that yes, that was that was a shortcoming. Um, again, it's not a fellowship in terms of like, it, 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 like your salvation, your eternal salvation. That, that's not, that's not the context at all. The context is abiding and having a, like, you know, again, when you're, when you're married to your husband and wife, if there's some kind of argument or sin or something, th there's going to be some tension there. And that's when, when you're honest with God and honest with yourself, you're restoring that intimacy. 
And that, I believe that's what that verse is saying. And not only is it saying that, and, it, and a lot of people would say, oh, well, if you're going to say that, then, well, you got to, people are going to be hyper, um, and people do, uh, people wrongly do uh, take this verse as, oh, you got to confess every sin that you ever think of. No, that's not the idea at all. It's just that while you're abiding, uh, when you're, you're, sh you're being honest with God and he's showing you things about how you fell short or where you need to grow, you simply agree to it. And would, and uh, not only does he forgive give you for, for that as you agree with it, he forgives you all the sins that you you that that he cleansed you from all right on un, all unrighteousness. So uh, every even things that you don't remember at that time, he fully cleanses you of. That's the I believe that's the context, and so that's why I brought up that that idea of I'm surprised by everyone's answers. Hmm. All these times we've talked about that uh, scriptures, uh, I'm, it seems you still don't understand my position. The um, yeah, I think that's the gospel message inserted in there. But uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't know. Don't anybody's against uh, uh, the idea of uh, telling God I'm sorry for what I've done and, and confessing that I've sinned. But I, I don't think it's. Uh, serves the purpose of uh, getting God to be, to uh, turn to me again because God's turned his back on me. In other words, God will not uh, stop fellowship with me because of sin. But for me, uh, if uh, this, the, the parable of the, not parable, but the, the story of the prodigal son, uh, I, I call it the, the uh, story of the backslidden son. So he's 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 his son. So that tells me that he's born again. He's a child. He's a child of God. But he goes off and gets in the pig's pen. But uh, all the while, the father is anxious. He got his arms waiting all this time for his son to come back. The father never turned his back on the son and requires confession or repentance. Uh, but the son uh, and does it, uh, and it's good for the son. It's good for us to do it because now we get it off of our conscience, but not because God re requires it. Otherwise, he he can't have fellowship with us. That's that's my position. So, uh, but we can move on. I don't, we haven't even heard Heather's answer yet. Well, real quick, yeah. I, have to, I have to answer. I I would agree with that. I would agree with that, and I think that's why I said later on, like you know. Uh, if our heart condemns us, God is greater. I I, I agree. Again, I agree. God never, God's not in a swivel chair. We, actually, we're on that swivel chair. God never turns from us, but we turn from him. And so, uh, like you said, confessing it is really uh, uh, for our benefit. So I, I agree. Yeah, and there was a character, some people here might know her and remember her, uh, Brain Audi. Does anybody, does that sound familiar to anybody? Brain Audi? Yeah, I haven't seen that name in a long time. Brain Audi is uh, really as, as she's as scholarly as any of us, maybe all of us ended together. I'm just talking about the effort she's put into her uh, studies. Uh, but she, I had many conversations with her privately and, and, and uh, she she was in the church. I forgot the name of the man that founded the church. He's he's famous for this kind of thing, though. And that is they use First John 1, 9 as a, a religious protocol where she says she has to stop what she's doing and confess her, her sin every throughout the entire day, all day long. She's constantly just stopping and confessing her sin to restore her fellowship. And she believed that if she didn't do that, uh, God's rejected her as far as fellowship and your, your prayers can't even be heard. God will not even hear your prayers until you do that so it became like an obsession with her right, right. and i think a lot of people do that it becomes a really very legalistic and a harmful thing right but let's let's get heather's uh, answer i think that's the important um the important point here um sister lisa said a couple weeks ago something that really stuck with me um which should not surprise anyone because she is sister Lisa often says things that are very deep, but um, it, what she said was, if you are looking at the sin, you will go to the sin. Mm -hmm. 
So here's my thing. We could either sit here and identify 50 to 100 to 1,000 different things that we're not allowed to do and say, I'm not allowed to do that, so I'm not going to do that. Or we could sit here and live our lives just like we would in any other relationship, like my children and I. We have specific rules in our house that are not the same and would probably surprise most of you that are not the same as most other houses. Most mothers would say, you are not allowed to jump on your bed because you might get hurt. In, in our house, you are allowed to jump on mommy and daddy's bed, but only if mommy and daddy are there so that we can make sure that you don't get hurt. So is jumping on the bed a sin? Not in our house. You know what I mean? Um, but if my children are constantly thinking, oh, if I jump on my bed, my bed, I'm going to get in trouble, then it leads them to want to do that. So, so in my saying, we don't focus on our sin, we don't, we don't focus on trying so hard not to do it that our life is miserable. But as with any other relationship, when I mess up, because I mess up, I say, oh, Lord, I know I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have watched that episode of, I don't know, The Walking Dead. I haven't watched it in a long time, but I used to. I shouldn't have watched that episode of The Walking Dead, not because watching that episode was wrong, but because I've been convicted in my spirit that this is not edifying and maybe I shouldn't be watching it. Or, oh, I should have spent a little bit more time reading my Bible today. Not because I'm held to a standard of how much Bible I have to read every day, but because I personally feel like I have drawn back. Not that God has gone anywhere because God hasn't left. He's not moved. He's right there with his arms open wide, ready to receive me at any moment. But if I pull away, just like with any other relationship. If I pull away, then the relationship suffers, not because God doesn't want me or doesn't love me or anything like that, but because I am no longer seeking that first. So I think that's the most important thing is that we make sure that what we do, no matter what it is, if it's eating broccoli, if it's, if it's eating meat, if it's, if it's jumping on the bed, they were doing it knowing what what we feel like God has told us is allowed in our relationship with him. <laughs> and Liam just woke up and heard me talking about jumping on the bed. But um, that that's my point. And as far as repenting of it, I don't see a problem with saying, oh, Lord, I messed up on that. I know I'm forgiven. Before I've ever done it, I'm forgiven. But to say I've messed up, I think that's a, that comes from a heart of love. And as long as you've got a heart of love, I don't, I don't think that anything is unforgivable. That being said, um, there is an opposite extreme that says that because Jesus paid for it all, everything is already covered. So I can do whatever I want to do. Well, I got to tell you, if you do that in a marriage, you will very quickly find yourself divorced because you can't just go out and do and spend and whatever um, just because, oh, we have money. I can go spend it. Trust me, that's gotten me in trouble more than once. In fact, that's gotten me in trouble today. But um there, there has to be rules and there has to be um, guidelines and you have to know what they are, but you don't focus so much on them that that's the only thing that you ever do. And you don't ignore them because they're going to love me anyway. God's going to love me anyway, regardless of what I do. I hope that made sense. Okay. Yeah, I did. Thank you. Uh, all right. Now, I, it certainly begs the question for Sister Lisa. Uh, I mean, you can just go ahead and rest on my laurels if you want, Lisa. But uh, everybody had a lot to say, and we do have time for follow-up uh, answers. So could, would you like to respond to anything that's been said on this question? Oh, all right. Look, since you're going to twist my arm and not let me get off easy. I was trying to coast like Ben does sometimes. <laughs> 
Okay, let's see. How about this? I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about what uh, Ben was saying. Um, just one thing that I would want to add is that people make the mistake of <laughs> only reading 1 John 1 9 and not continuing through the rest of the epistle because if they did, they get to chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, now that lady that you mentioned that she said was a very scholarly woman that kept, and I did this. I tell you, I was 10 years old. I tried this mess. I was like, that don't work. I was, I'll never forget. I told the story before I was at recess at school <laughs> and you only get like 15 minutes for recess that the teacher was, was really chillaxing or having a conversation. You might get 20 if she was having a good time talking to somebody else. We used to try to distract her to get recess extended by the way. But anyway, uh, I was sitting out there and I was thinking about all the things I had done that morning, just coming to school, you know, little tips you get into with your brother, your sisters and stuff. And I'm going through confessing stuff and I'm looking at my, my at the clock that's outside for recess and I'm going, I only got a couple of minutes and I'm going through all this stuff I know I done did wrong before we even got to 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, oh, forget this. I won't even enjoy my recess. So uh, I knew it didn't work since I was 10 years old. That whole, Jesus, forgive me this, Jesus, forgive me that, Jesus, forgive me this, Jesus, forget. You can't remember it all. So if 1 John 1, 9 was something we're supposed to do in that regard, where I'm constantly thinking about what I did so I can make sure I ask for forgiveness, otherwise I'm out of fellowship, then why doesn't he repeat it here? Okay, so let me let me do it again. My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin... If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No. Now he says, if any man sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Okay. <laughs> and he is the propitiation. Chap chapter 2, verse 2. And he is the propitiation for our sin. And not for ours only, but also for the sin of the whole world that also re repudiates that Jesus is only for the for the Jews right there, for the sins of the whole world. I don't think anybody would say that the whole world is the Jews. So now, uh, when we look at this and we see that we have an advocate, what does that mean? An advocate, if you look it up in law, is, is basically what they say, your mouthpiece, right? That's the lawyer. That's the one who pleads your case for you. You go to court and you're standing before the judge. And the lawyer say, don't say nothing unless I tell you to say so. Or the judge asks you directly, don't say nothing. I'm the one that speaks. So the advocate is Jesus Christ, the righteous. So if we do miss something, we're covered by Jesus. And that's this is when I saw this, and that's why I never, I don't worry about it. Now, I don't say that if something convicts me, I don't say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry for that. Or, oh, Father, you know, we should repent daily. Repent means change your mind. Like uh, Brother Luke has often stated, and I love when he says it, who but a fool would continue in error once their error is revealed to them. So if changing the mind, which is what repentance is, from whatever it is to something else. So we understand based on the scripture that the repentance that is needed for salvation is from unbelief, whatever it was, new age, whatever teaching, whatever it was, from unbelief, from a false way to the real way, to faith in Christ. That's what's saved. So uh, when we discover that we have some error somewhere in our life, who but a fool would continue in error? So you would repent, which is to change your mind, be submitted to Christ. When we get in these scriptures and we see something and we go, ooh. I didn't. Even, there's people who have done that. They didn't even know certain things were sin, and they read the Bible, and they're not even doing it through a legalistic standpoint. They just want to know the truth and love God and be in uh, agreement with Christ. And they come across something and go, "I didn't know that was a sin." And then what? They change their mind. They begin to put that away. Hey, the Lord said that sin. I got to get this out of my life. Okay, so that's all it is. And these legalists run around bopping people in the head with the hammer. Uh, destroying people's lives, putting them under a burden the Lord did never intend. He said, if we came unto him, his yoke was easy and his burden was light, and he meant it. And all we have to do is trust in him and believe in him, 
be led by the spirit. We discover something that's in error, correct the error. You know, it ain't hard, but people try to make it hard. And it's really sad because they pe put people under a burden that the Lord never intended for them to have. Oh, yeah, I'm in. No, I would no, say no, Cameron, you caught me dancing and celebrating listening to Sister Lisa. Ben, did you capture that so we can put it on the loop? On, on <laughs> yeah, the that, that, no, that was a really great uh, great answer, Lisa. That's basically what I what I see first John where it says confess our sins. It's more like uh well if you don't if you if you again it's more like not need, that you have to confess your sins, it's more like okay, well you're abiding in Christ, you're in the light, and he's showing he, in the light exposes uh, sin. I mean, it shows your short, shortcomings. Now, again, it's not like a like a, a way to you know uh, for God to punish you. It's 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 again it's it's, it's an intimacy thing, uh, abiding in it, and it's a way to grow. And so, if He shows you that if you if you, that light exposes you, you know an area of your life you're not dealing with the sin, uh, you know you, the the normal. I think the normal uh, person is going to say, okay, what do I do about it? And it, 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 he's basically saying. Don't worry about it. You know, uh, if you want to do something about it, conf confess it. And uh, rather than uh, rather than say it's not a sin, uh, you know, again, the, so it's not God uh, taking tw swiveling his chair. It's you swiveling your chair and and saying, oh, and denying the truth, depressing the truth and saying, no, it's not a sin. And so, again, and that's what the whole Bible, that's what the whole first John is about. You know, darkness and lightness cannot coexist because it's 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 really a refuting Gnostic teaching about uh, these Gnostics who taught that uh, good and evil, light and darkness, were symbiotic and they could coexist. And that's why you see these stark statements in First John, like in Him there's no darkness at all, and who is born of God does not sin. You know, we know that those um, don't mean that you know if you're saved you'll never sin again. It's saying that the new man born in Christ does not sin. In Him there's no sin at all. Though so. It's very, it's very contextualized, and I think you did a great explanation, uh, Lisa. So that was awesome. Oh, praise yeah. the Lord! But Ben, really, did you get Brother Luke doing the dance so we could get it on like a, a gif or something and play it back over and over? <laughs> yeah, yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, well, I think everybody ought to thank me because uh, I had to pry out an answer from Lisa, but once I got her to talk, it was very worthwhile, wasn't it? The Lord be magnified. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Okay. Uh, but I think that uh, the, uh, at least in my mind, uh, the, uh, the context of the, the answer uh, had to do with uh, what Lisa had said years ago. I don't know if she said it or it's just posted on her channel. You know how if you watch the uh, uh, talking with what is it uh saturday night what is it called uh uh late night with lisa late, and friends yes, late night i'll get you a t-shirt <laughs> the you you have a the visual presentation with all the things that you have up there are it's beautiful how it's done but uh uh that kind of a thing i've seen and that's where i first heard this this term terminology be sun conscious not sin conscious. So uh, like so many other things, I picked that up from, from uh, Lisa's uh, channel. And I think that because we all understand that uh, uh, the gospel and we're not lordship uh, heretics, uh, we, we can be aware uh, when we will want to be aware if we if we get if we uh, recognize that we're sinning, we we want to get out of that. Uh, but the the lordshippers that the reason that we resist it and uh, is that the lordshippers will use that to uh say you need to be sin conscious all the time because you got to get sin out of your life otherwise you're not going to get saved you're not going to stay saved or you never truly got saved if you don't uh get this sin out of your life so they're overly sin conscious thinking that this is necessary for their salvation that's not our problem. We understand the gospel correctly. So why should we be sin conscious except to know that, hey, uh, the, the, we want to uh, we want to grow, we want to mature uh, in, in Christ, and we want to uh, walk in the Spirit, and we don't want chastisement. We don't want uh, the consequences that come with sin. So those are the reasons that we're paying attention to sin, not because we want to be conscious in order to get salvation. Uh,